and inshallah towards the end we're gonna do like a q a okay uh so number one thing right if we define okay this is very important if we define god as something that exists yeah so something that exists that everything depends on okay so think about that for a sec it's something that exists that everything depends on what does everything depends on this means that everything that's not it so let's just say god exists everything that isn't god depends on uh it right so if we say that god is something that exists that everything depends on then you run into a contradiction because you can't have two things that exist that everything depends on so i'll explain what that means so let's say you had two gods okay first god is a and the second god is b in one breath you're saying that god a exists and everything depends on it but how can you say that everything depends on it when god b exists does that make sense? Because the definition of God is something that exists that's independent. It needs nothing, right? So it and, and, and another way to say it is that it's not a conditional existence. It doesn't exist under the condition of something else. It's an unconditional existence. So if you were to say that God A is something that exists, that everything depends on, but then there's something else that exists that doesn't depend on it, this is a contradiction. I hope that makes sense. So this is the first point. How can something exist that everything depends on it but not everything depends on it at the same time because God, because God be is independent, which means it doesn't need it. So that's, that's the first point. So by definition, it leads to the contradiction, right? So that's point number one. And again, we're going to do like a bunch of questions and answers like towards the end and stuff too. Um, okay. So second point is this. Okay. One second, I'm just going to go over my notes. So if two things, okay, so we have to define what necessary is. Okay. So in existence, right? Cause we all exist. This is reality. We live in a universe on earth. There's a sun, there's, Glass says there's things that exist, all right? There's a chair that exists, you exist. Okay, so there are two types of existences. Technically, there's a third type, but we're just going to make it very simple. We're just going to say there's two types for now, okay? The first type is something that's a necessary existence, and the second type is something that's a contingent existence, okay? So I'll explain what that means. So imagine if something exists, like for example, your keys, your keys, or even a pencil. Had this pencil not existed, would there still be existence? In other words, if I remove all the pencils from from uh, from the universe, will there still be a universe? Will there still be an existence? Obviously, that's the case, which means the pencil is not necessary. It's contingent. It can exist or it cannot exist. It doesn't really hold a bearing to the very nature of existence, if that makes sense. So that's a contingent existence. Now, the opposite of that, what's a necessary existence? A necessary existence, by definition, is something that necessarily has to exist no matter what. So in like another way you can say it is positing its non-existence will lead to a contradiction. You can never posit the non-existence of something that's necessary. So I hope you guys understand. This is very important to make the second point. You need to understand the difference, the distinction between something that's necessary and something contingent. So I'll summarize it real quick for those of you guys that just joined. Something that's contingent is something that exists that doesn't need to exist necessarily. And something that's necessary is something that exists, but ha it has to exist. In other words, positing its non-existence le leads to a contradiction. Because there is existence, right? So imagine if you had two things that exist that are necessary, which means both of them have to exist within existence. That means they would depend on each other to exist. And I'll explain what this means. And now this is going to be kind of a, it's one of those things where it's, it's hard to understand at the start, but once you get it, you're like, wow, that makes so much sense. So let me explain. Imagine you had a room, okay? And you had two people in this room. One person says to you, well, one person says, I have to always exist in this room. I can never leave. I have to always exist. And the other person in the room says, I can live by myself. I'm an unconditional existence. I'm an independent existence. I can just be by myself. How can you have an existence with one, with, with one God saying that he can be by himself? He doesn't need anything to exist. But then in another sense, there's, some, and there's another God that exists that says, actually, no, I have to exist because I'm necessary, which means you can't be, you can't be by yourself. Which means God would not be independent in this case. They would actually depend on each other to exist, which goes the very definition of God, what God is. Because God is something that's independent. I hope that makes sense. I'm going to say it one more time just, just so like uh, to clarify in case some of you guys have uh, questions and we can talk about it later on too. So number one, God is something that's necessary, which means he always has to exist, okay? And is independent, which means another way to say that is he has an unconditional existence. There is no condition that needs to be met in order for him to exist. 
and other like for you, your your conditional existence, you exist under the condition that water exists, for example, without water, you cease to exist. So God is an unconditional existence, which means he needs nothing to exist. He can just be by himself. He doesn't need anything else. So how can you say that there are two things that exist that are necessary? Because if two things that exist are necessary, that means one of them is saying that they can be by themselves. And another one is saying that, no, you can't be by yourself because I always have to exist. So this, this leads into a contradiction, which means they don't actually, they're not independent anymore. They're now a conditional existence. They can only exist on the condition that the other exists with them. I know this might sound a bit confusing, but like maybe towards the end, we can do a QA and a inshallah. So, so now we, we just went over two points. The first point is you can't say that everything depends on it, right? When, uh, when there's something that doesn't depend on it. And the second contradiction is you can't have two necessary existences when one says it can be by itself and the other says... I always have to exist. This is another contradiction. Okay, so uh, the third and fourth point, these are kind of interesting. I feel like uh, number three or number four might resonate with a lot more people. And again, guys, this is, all this is to say is without looking at the Quran, without looking at the Bible, without looking at anything, just our aql alone, just our logic and reason, we can get to the conclusion that there must be one God truly, okay? And we can talk about the Trinitarian view and whatnot later on if you guys want. So... Now, the third reason. Now, I've already presented two logical reasons. I'll give you a third one, okay? So, if one, because uh, we have to look at the essence of Allah, right? If Allah's essence is that he is the most powerful, okay? So, if God is known as the most, yani, there's nothing else other than it. It's the most powerful, okay? How can you have two things that hold the same title? Both of them are the most powerful. In other words, imagine you had one God, okay? One God says that he has power over everything. And the other God says, well, I have power over everything. Okay, that means who has power over each other? Think of it like a tug of war. You have on one end, something super powerful, and on, on, the, on, on the other end, something super powerful. If they're both playing tug and war, which one has power over each other? Well, they don't. They won't have power over each other. They will limit each other in that sense, which means that they wouldn't be able to control one another. So how can something say in one breath, I have power over everything, but then in another breath say, except I can't have power over that? I'm going to say it one more time. How Imagine there's two gods, God A and God B. God A is making a bold claim. God A is saying, I have power over everything. But then God B is saying, but you can't have power over me because I have the same level as you. So how can God have power over everything but not have power over something? The other God. I hope that makes sense. Usually when I do these talks, like uh, it's like more of a Q&A and people can jump in and ask questions, but hopefully we'll do it towards the end. I ho hopefully that made sense. So essentially what we're doing, guys, is we're going through the essence of God. What, what makes God God? We said everything depends on it. We see how that, that's, that's a contradiction. We say that it's necessary. We see that that's a contradiction. You can't have two necessary. Okay. And now we went through the third point, the most powerful existence, something that controls everything, has power over everything. How can it have power over everything, but then not power over something? This is a contradiction. So now we have three logical scenarios, logical... Uh, examples with a little bit of an analogy through the tug and war example as to why there must be one God. Okay, you can't have two. You can't have two things that say they have power over everything, but then they don't have power over each other. They limit each other. Okay. And this is the last point I'm going to mention. Okay. And this is actually a very, very interesting point. And I think personally, this is my favorite one. That's why I left it for the end. You know, uh, when I eat food during lunch or you know or whatnot, I always save the dessert for the end because uh, it's my favorite and I like to kind of make that throughout these discussions too. So <laughs> so number four, I know it's super cringe, I'm sorry. But anyways, okay, so number four, my favorite one, okay? This is gonna be very abstract. So I want everyone to take a big step back, maybe drink some water, grab some popcorn, it's gonna be super sick. Okay, so imagine you have two gods, okay? The first god, his name is A, and the second god, his name is B. Okay? So we have A, which is God A, and then B, which is God B. Okay? We're saying that there is a distinction between them, right? We can't say that God A is equal to God B. The very fact that we're saying there's something that exists called God A, and there's something else that exists called God B, this, this means that there is a distinction. Does that make sense? Like the fact, the very fact that we're using words to say there's one God and then there's another God, that means there's something different about these two gods. Because if they're I identical, if they're exactly identical, then they're the, then there's just one God. We're just saying two gods, but we're just having fun. We're just like, it doesn't make sense. We can't, you just, I hope that makes sense. Basically, you can't say that there is two gods and say they're exactly identical. That means that means they're not, there's not two gods. There's only one. They're, they have the exact same everything. So the fact that we're saying that there's a distinction between God A and God B, that means there must be something different. 
Keep this in mind. That means there must be something different about God A that God B doesn't have. I'll make it, I'll give a very simple example. Imagine if God A has a mustache. This could be the distinction and God B doesn't have a mustache. That's why we can distinguish between each other. Now you're probably thinking, okay, Moshi, what's, what's the problem with that? Who cares that there's a distinction between them? Why can't there be two gods with a distinction? Because then they are no longer depend independent. They're now dependent. You know why? Because in order for God A to exist, let's say God A has the mustache, whatever character trait, whatever trait that makes a distinction between God B. That means God A now depends on this distinction in order to be uh, existing. Because without this distinction, it would be the exact same as the other God. So this is the fourth point. How can there be two God? How can there be two gods? When this God would depend on the very distinction, that means he's not, that means he's dependent. He's no longer independent, which goes against the very essence of God. That's, uh, that's, that's basically the top four points uh, that I kind of came up with. I wanted to share um, something very important is in this discussion, we're already presupposing the existence of God and something that's independent and necessary. So it's not necessarily a conversation about, oh, prove God exists logically. It's if he is to exist, if he was to exist, why there must be one. And I think this is very important because when you, when you have a belief system, okay, you have to look at, like when you look at the different religions, yeah, you look at the very fundamental, the very uh, foundation of this uh, belief. It's the, the way they describe God. So if one person says there's 17 different gods, right away, your aql, right? Your logic and reason, the thing God gave you, it should, it should hit you a bit. It should be like, that doesn't make sense. And the reason why, well, I just gave you four examples that you can hold to your heart. Inshallah, maybe when you guys have kids or whatnot, you can share these points with them too. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's it. It's very quick, not too long. Also, I just want to say something too. I honestly know nothing. I'm just, uh, I'm just a fellow person, just like learning, just like everyone else. And, uh, yeah, that's it. So, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. Oh, yeah. Um, Moshi, would you be okay with taking questions now? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's take some questions. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions? You can raise your hand and I'll bring you up onto the stage or just DM them to me. Okay. Someone's got a question. I'll be uh, yeah, I'll face Ali. Salaam Salaam. I want to thank uh, Mushi for coming to this event. Uh, Mushi, if, yes. if anyone says, what's wrong with uh, a God depending on another God, that's okay. Okay, how would you answer that? The problem with having a God that depends on another God, that to say that, okay, that's fine. You want to say that your God is dependent and not independent. The problem with that is you run you run into an issue. Now think about it. How can you have an existence? Okay, how can you have an existence with only things that are dependent? You can either run into an infinite regress fallacy or you can say that these two things depend on one another. If these two things depend on one another, let's look at it from a temporal setting and then an atemporal setting. I'll, I'll show the contradiction in both, okay? From a temporal setting, imagine uh, two things depend on one another. God A can never ever exist unless God B exists. It depends on it, right? It's a conditional existence. But God B can never ever exist unless God A exists. This means that both of them would only ever exist within their essence. They can never actually materialize within existence. So the symbiotic relationship. So the foundation of existence cannot be two things that depend on one another. Because none, neither, neither of them would ever materialize. Does that make sense? Like, there, there, there necessarily has to be something that's independent. That doesn't need another to materialize. It just is. So how, so uh, because I, I, something that's conditional, a conditional existence, something that's dependent, it exists, it, it, it has an essence, it has a, a certain uh, thing that makes it special, but what actually brings it into existence, it isn't its essence alone. Its essence does not necessitate its existence. In other words, when, when I have a chair, okay, just just because we have a description of what a chair is, it doesn't necessarily mean that this chair is automatically going to exist. It necessarily needs another. So if you have two, th that's why it's a conditional existence. So if God A exists under the condition of God B, and God B can, can exist under, under the condition that God A exists, then this is just a thought experiment that can only exist in our heads. It's, it's, it can never actually materialize within existence. There necessarily has to be a foundation, like a sea floor, and an independent existence that's unconditional. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I have another question. Um, if a Christian or a Hindu came here, say, well, like, uh, how can you explain the oneness of God to them? How can I explain the, the way I explained it now? The problem is what's going to happen is they're going to say, no, God, God is, uh, 
like for example, let's just say I was talking to a Christian and they tell me, oh no, it's 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 three persons in one. I'll be like, okay, cool. If I prove to, and this, this is all I would have to ask them, I'd be like, okay, listen, let's say their name is John. John, if I can prove a contradiction within this very belief of yours, would you still believe it? One of two things can happen, right? If they say they still believe it, then that means they're claiming, they're saying that their worldview is unjustified, which means they no longer have any right. Like that means if someone comes up to them and says that they think that a frog created the universe, they're not allowed to say it doesn't make sense because their own belief system doesn't make sense. And uh, they can believe what they want to believe. If they want to believe something's illogical, that's by all means. But if I prove the contradiction and they uh, like, but, but if they say that, oh no, my thing follows logic, but I prove the contradiction, then they can't hold that belief system anymore. So basically, bro, I, I just prove it through logic and reason, but so we both have to come and agree. Is logic even a good tool? Do you even want to use logic? If they say no, then they say no. Uh, we, we, we can't really force someone to not use their aql. You know, we can't force someone to use their aql. Also, well, I heard from a Christian that the Trinity between you and God yes. doesn't need to be logical. It doesn't need to doesn't be logical? Be... Yeah. Basically, you know, why should why should God be subject to logic? Yeah. So what if God's just outside of logic in that sense? Yeah. There are, okay, yeah. there are... I would like... Okay, th there are certain things that are necessarily true, irrespective of whether we like them to be or not. So for example, one plus one equals true. This is necessarily true. Like we can't, we can't make one plus one equal seven, even if our feelings so, like change, right? Moshi, so I, uh, yes. yeah. what would you say in response to somebody who believes in true contradictions? For example, I know there's a Christian theologian by the name of JC Ball or something. He wrote a book on the like, uh, illogical like the problem is with the incarnation correct he is a christian by the way who believes in the incarnation and he wrote a book on why the incarnation is illogical yet at the end he confirms that he still believes in it however he believes in things which are true contradictions they're true but they're just simply contradictory how would you respond to somebody who believes in that so like if someone tells that, true contradictions. sure if, if someone says that hey for example one plus one equals 17 they say that this is a contradiction or, or they say like a triangle has 17 sides they say that this is clearly a contradiction, but I believe it's true. I would then ask them what, like, okay, cool. This is like your conclusion that you claimed that these contradictions are true. What, what premises, what, what, what got you to this conclusion? Like, how do you know that it's like, basically, if they say this to me, if they say like, what, what, what can they say? It's just because they feel like it just because they want it to be true. Like what, um, what, what would the response be? Like, if they say contradictions are true, a triangle can exist with 17 sides. Okay, cool. Like, how do you get to that conclusion? Did they use their brain to get there? Did they use logic to get there? Nope. It went around logic. Mm -hmm. But to get um, to that, but but to get to that conclusion, basically what they're saying is this: is what if God's outside of logic, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the or they're, if they believe in true contradictions, yeah. Right. I mean, that's if they if they affirm the contradiction or the illogic, like it being illogical, but they say that it's just true in its nature. Like you, you know what I'm trying to say. Like they, affirm true they, they, can, they can they can say that but then but they wouldn't be able to justify it like they wouldn't be able to justify this so it's it's kind of meaningless yeah. Yeah. it's like if someone tells yeah. me a triangle has 17 sides they're allowed to say this but if you can't prove it and you can't like communicate with it you're it's to be honest it's kind of meaningless you can yeah. it's, it's it's an unjustifiable worldview and then to, and to, to be honest be able to... sorry say that again you wouldn't be able to like critique other theologies because like if you believe exactly. your own like yeah. Exactly. If your foundation to to your belief system, your worldview is illogical, then if some guy says a monkey created everything, you can't say that's false. You can't say that that doesn't make sense. And and honestly, yeah. to that, I, I always had this thought in my head, okay? If they believe that God exists and they have this notion that God wants people to get closer to him, that's the purpose of humans, to get closer to God. I'd ask them, if if God created humans for the purpose to get closer to him, how are humans supposed to get closer to him? What tools are they supposed to use if they can't use logic and reason? Are they supposed to play the Are they supposed to play the guessing game? And if they play the guessing game, they, the, sorry. What if they say revel? What if they say like revelation or scripture or something like that's what they use? But the problem is, why should I follow that scripture? They, they can't bring me anything that makes like they can't. They're not allowed to use logic and reason at all. They can't say that oh because this scripture makes sense. Basically, what I'm saying is this: if your worldview entails that logic is not necessary then that means mm -hmm. that you can't, you, can you really blame humans for not getting closer to your God? Like, because then anything can be true. And then I, I, I'd question how can their God be just in that sense? 
like anything can be true literally because logic is not necessary yeah, so I'm, wait, I'm getting a lot of questions uh yeah think okay so someone asked me think about a particle being in two places at the same time that's a contradiction that's an example of a true contradiction i would say no that's a false equivocation because a particle being in the same place a particle being in the same place particle being in two different places at the same time is like what it, even if, if it is a scientifically true thing then that's not a contradiction is it I, I think it's like apparent, yeah I, I i think it would be an apparent contradiction it's not necessarily a true contradiction yeah like, yeah yeah and, and apparently that's what I was, that's what i was trying to say an apparent contradiction uh wait is seeker of truth that i was going to bring him up next okay who okay who next i'll bring up uh Viral. Viral. Yeah. Um, oh my god, viral. viral. What's popping? What's popping? I had a question from Oshi. Yeah, Vanessa, what's going on? Popping. Okay, so, like, what would really be the difference? What do people really mean when they say oneness? Because, like, for example, technically, there is one me, there's one doubt finesser. Yeah. Right? <laughs> But like, what's the difference between us saying, oh, God is one or us saying something else is one, right? Like, for example, there might be one specific golden watch in such arrangement, right? But what's right. the difference between saying God is one and just something else is one, right? Like, is there a specific thing to do with his oneness rather than just, you know, some like numeric one? You're saying what makes him unique in him being one than versus like me being one, for example? Yeah, what's the difference between us saying, oh, there's only one Moshi versus us saying, oh, there's only one God, right? The difference is this, okay, this one Moshi that exists, okay, is he a con does, he, does he exist under the condition that something else exists? And if it is, then that means my own essence does not necessitate my existence because I'm a contingent being. So if God exists and he's an unconditional existence, here's the difference that's unique between me being one and him being one, is that his essence does necessitate his existence. Because his essence is, therefore he exists. That's it. There doesn't need to be another. So that's that's a distinction. You can have two things that are one, sure. But if one one, the first thing, if it's a it's it's an unconditional existence, which means it, can, it exists under no condition, which means its essence necessitates its existence. And the other one that claims to be one, like one Moshi, sure, I'm one, but I'm a conditional existence. I, my essence does not mean anything. I, my essence is only an identifier, but it doesn't materialize my own existence. If that makes sense. Yeah, so that would be talking about more like the contingency argument. I'm talking more like uh, like the difference between like ahad and like wahad, right? Like what would be the, like why why when it comes to God, we say oneness, right? But when we talk to my one, we don't say oneness. Like what would be that specific difference? I know what you're saying there, but I'm more putting it to like a different category, if that makes sense. To be honest, well, I don't understand the question, Akhi. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fine. No, you, you can try asking it again if you want. Like, I just don't get what you're saying. Yeah, okay. So, like, why do we say oneness when it comes to Allah, right? When 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 we refer to Allah's one, right? But how? But in other instances, we say only one when it talks about other things. Oneness, like for example, when I see you, Moshi, I say you are one, Moshi. But when I see when I see, when I refer to Allah, I say, oh, Allah is not just one, but He's oneness. Like, is it something like describing the divisibility or something? Like him being like yeah, pure? Yeah, because, because if, yeah, like if we think about the concept of one, like the number one, for example, one may depend on there being decimals or may depend on there being a zero or a two or a three after it, right? Like it's, there is something that it, it would depend on. When we say, I guess you can think about it this way, like the oneness of Allah, is it really the idea of one? Well, he's he's an indivisible, unlimited being. He's the, the oneness that is Allah. So in other words, if, if I had two things that are infinite, infinite, they're really just one thing. They're just infinite. He's the oneness, the most powerful. It's not really one as in a number one, because this number one is, is dependent too. It's just the oneness that is Allah. So, it's uh, not exactly so are, are you pretty much saying that like, it's not a numeric one. The fact that we're saying one is just like an easy way to say it in language. You know what I mean? That's but the like, best way we can use to describe yeah, it. Yeah, the, the best way we can use it with like our shitty language we have, right? Pretty much, yeah. And even either way, this is something else I want to talk about too. It's like when, when we say Allah loves us, yeah? 
Like, what is love, right? Like, we know love as an experience between two individuals, let's just say, right? So this idea of love as an experience, we associate it with Allah. But to be honest, if you think about the word love, it doesn't do justice for the connection Allah has for us to be uh, for, for, for the connection. This connection, it doesn't do it justice. However, it's the only word we use as humans to best describe its connection towards us, Allah's connection for us, if that makes sense. So in the same sense, when we say one, like it's the best thing that we can use to describe it, but it's, it's oneness. It is just it just is and it will always be absolute it's, truth. It, wouldn't it almost be like saying not only is God. OK, so the oneness of God would be this. It's literally the fact that there is no other. So we call it one. Right. That's that's the oneness of God. If you want to put it in numbers right into this number system, all it would mean is that there is no other. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Right. Like there literally is no other. I think is is that a good way to put it? No, I'm um, wait, Vanessa, could we just keep it to one more question? Because there's a lot of people. Sorry, yeah, question. of course. That was my question. All right. You know, I'm asking them, I guess. Okay, I've got one, two, two questions in DMs. Okay. One is, um, what would be your response to a pagan or a polytheist? Like just, just a simple, like simple, okay. like, uh, not uh, overcomplicated to a pagan, a pagan. It depends. Like there, there are different types of uh, pagans. Like one of them would say oh. that I worship this statue because it gets me closer to one God. And some say that this statue is God. So like what? One uh, believing in multiple like divine beings, basically. Like that kind of. Like one people who believe in multiple gods, like actual yeah, like, multiple gods, like Greek paganism or something like that. Not like worshiping idols, like. Yeah, you know, I, I I ask them: Is there is there one god that's above all of them, or are they all equally the same? All equal multiple gods. Okay. Do they possess a god? Does a god possess the title most powerful, or no? In their sense. Uh yes. Yes. Okay, so then that's the contradiction. How? Let's just say you had two gods. Forget 17. Let's just say you had two. One god says, I am the most powerful, which means he has power over everything. Another god says, I am the most powerful. I have power over everything. Does yeah. one god have power over another? Obviously not. They can't, they can't, because they're, they're the exact same power. So they don't yeah. have power over everything. So they can't hold the title. Um, no, no god can ever hold the title most powerful if there's two. Yeah. And what would you say to an idolater then? If they weren't like a, like what somebody who said that I like I worship these idols to get closer to God. I worship these idols to get closer to God. Um, like 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 the other example you gave, yeah. It, it, you you'd have to go about a different like you you can attack the philosophy or the theology. Like if they say I worship this <laughs> statue or whatever because this statue gets me closer to God, I then the I can attack the theology. Be like, okay, where in the theology does it tell you that that's the case? And I can look at it this way. But the number two is like. If, if God exists and you believe God exists, then, and he's truly all powerful and all knowing, yani why, why would you worship anything else other than him? And the reason, and, and a good way to explain it is this, this statue that you worship, it is the same, if not worse than you, because this statue is a possible existence. It's a contingent existence. It doesn't need to exist. So you're literally bowing and, and it's not even uh, lively uh, like you. It doesn't even have free will. So you're not only worshiping something that's contingent, but you're worshiping something that's below like the lowest bottom pile of contingent things. And you just point that out to them. And if that's their prerogative, that's a prerogative. Yeah, I mean, what do you want me to do? They have their way. I have my way. <laughs> and another question. So what do you think about the Christians that say that classical identity doesn't apply to the Trinity and they reject it for the Trinity only and the Trinity alone? What's your response other than them rejecting logic? Why is rejecting the law of liveness, the law of indescribability, controversial? Because there are certain propositions that are necessarily... Uh, Sorry. Yeah, sir? Uh, it's, it's not uh, the law of indescribability. It's the law of... Law of himself on indiscernibility indescribe you typed indescribability you little like look at this guy look at him inviting himself on stage and then correcting himself <laughs> sorry moshi um yeah just yeah, his so, question yeah so uh, well first i have to i have to understand where their where their heads at so if i say for example like th there are certain propositions that are necessarily true whether you like them or not like like i said one plus one equals two like these are necessary propositions that are true the language yeah sure the language we created 
but the concept that the essence of these what, what we're pointing towards this this idea of logic is necessarily true whether you like it or not so if you say that god's outside of logic you're going against necessary truths and by the way you have to you have, a good way to look at it is this okay if one plus one and all there's necessary propositions we didn't invent these propositions we invented the language but not the propositions themselves if we didn't invent them and you believe God exists, then God must be the only thing responsible for these propositions. He's the one that gave you these propositions. So why would God give you objective truth for you to go against it? That's, that's the first thing you can look at it. But also too, bro, if you look at the theology too, like where 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 does it say the Trinity? And you can you, you can look at the theology too, like how, like if, if they want to accept logic whatsoever, then you look at the, you look at the very scripture that they follow. Show me where it talks about the Trinity and then you can look into the theology. Like Matthew 28, 19. Perhaps. Yeah, but when you when you have a thing that alludes to a, a trinity of some sort, you also have other verses that say the Father is greater than I. So which means that it's not as clear cut. Like for example, in, in Islam we have Surah Ikhlas. It perfectly describes Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? It's 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 not an ambiguous verse. The very fact that there is a verse that goes against what whatever verse you give me means it's not as clear cut as they they seem to be. And the very fact that it got introduced in like the third or fourth century, and the fact that there are still Christians today that don't hold the trinitarian view, just alludes to that very position. Uh okay. Um another question. Sure. What law does the Trinity contradict that makes it illogical and what is that law? Yeah, it's called the the uh the law of identity. So for example, mm. um is Jesus e oh, so for, I'll make it simple. If is if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then it necessarily follows that A has to be equal to C. If A is identical to B and cool. B is identical to C, then A has to be identical to C as well. So if you look at it from the Trinitarian standpoint, if you have Jesus is equal to God and the Holy Spirit is equal to God, then it necessarily follows that Jesus is equal to the Holy Spirit. But they wouldn't say that. They say there's a distinction. How in one breath can there be a distinction, but then in another there isn't? And you're saying they're identical to the same thing. This is an example of the law of identity just being broken. Hmm. Just it's, It doesn't, it doesn't uh, respect logic. Yeah. I don't see anyone putting their hands up, so should I just play devil's advocate for a bit? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go nuts. Okay, so you said that the Trinity isn't in the scripture. Again, the Father greater than I, monarchical Christians wouldn't have a problem with affirming that. Uh, what would you say about 1 John 5, 7, then? That clearly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. Give me one sec. Which, I just have to Google it. Give me, what, what's it called? Uh, first John, like the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7. 5, verse 7. Okay, give me a sec. I'm just going to Google it. clearly lays out the doctrine of the Trinity. Thoughts of oh, someone, oh, never mind. Someone asked me something that's unrelated to this, but I'll answer them. No, it's okay. Give someone me a said sec. thoughts on orthodox. Someone said thoughts on orthodox corruption of the scripture. It's a very good book. You should read it. Okay, John five seven. For there are three bear that recorded the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and and these three are one. Well, then I I I'd exact uh, then the position that I would do then if I wanted to play super like you know like since we're going devil's advocate, I'll be like okay, cool. Uh, this is like the apostle that wrote this. Uh, I mean, they'd claim that, yes. Right. Okay. So then I would have to say then, okay, cool. Your claim is that Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, chose someone and that someone wrote this book. How do yes. you know that that's the apostle that wrote it? Uh, okay. I'll go. Do you want me to go really devil's advocate, like proper? Go nuts. Go nuts. You know? Yeah, go nuts. Yeah, go nuts. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have John, John the apostle. He had a disciple called Poly St. Polycarp of uh, Smyrna, right? Uh, sure. He wrote like two books. He wrote an he wrote an epistle to the Philippians, and he also had a book. He also had a book written about him called the Martyrdom of Polycarp, in which it mentions that Saint Irenaeus was his student. Irenaeus says that uh, Irenaeus affirms authorship for the traditional Johannine work. So all the Gospels, one John, two John, three John, he says that John the Apostle wrote them. So a disciple of a disciple of John the Apostle claimed that he wrote it. Not only that, but you have multiple so say for example polycarp right he's a disciple of john the apostle he quotes uh, one john two times in his epistle to the philippians how does that how does that sorry you're saying that the disciple so let's say you have john the apostle writing this book then his mm -hmm. disciple's disciple cl confirmed it right yes and why his would, disciple, why would, the disciple Poly, saint polycarp he quoted it twice as well why so would he had why would but like why would his disciple's disciple deny it wouldn't it make sense that he would confirm no, it he, he did confirm it. He confirmed it. Yes, yes. Ignatius, right, I'm why? sorry, Irenaeus, called, Irenaeus confirmed it, yes. 
So 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 the proof. Yes. So hold up. The proof, the proof, yeah, that this is written by the apostle. Is that the apostle student student said so? Yes, that's called oral. It's called okay. So when we analyze works from antiquity, we do yeah. internal. We do examination of the internal evidence and the external evidence. Sure. Christian work usually are internally like works from antiquity are usually internally anonymous they usually have to have external attestation to the authorship correct so yes this would be normal external attestation to the authorship for one john is expected for most works of antiquity okay and but you do if... have external attestation strong external attestation corroborating external attestation even from poly uh, sorry irenaeus uh tertullian origin uh etc 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 you but, know but, like many church fathers. By, by the way my, my main thing is like philosophy not necessarily the theology like no. if, if someone doesn't want to accept like, I... and that's the role, the role to you but i, I just want to i'm like for me i want to learn to be honest well like i want to ask you a question so I... essentially what you're saying is this you're saying that this yeah. his john so the the apostle taught someone yeah and that someone taught someone and that person confirmed that john's the apostle yeah, it's called apostolic succession. Apostolic succession. Yeah. yeah, but what? But how okay, that Moshe, person? Should I, wait, should I refute it? It's like it's like really yeah, yeah. easy. You can just so sure, go ahead. one John five seven is a forgery. It's a fourth century Latin forgery, and it's not in any Greek manuscripts up until the ninth century even. If you go into uh, Professor Bruce Metzger's textual commentary on the Greek New Testament and you check the textual variants for one John five seven, he notes that it's a dubious and forged verse and it has no right to be in the new testament it's a forgery it's a latin interpolation no but, uh, e but e even even so, e even if it wasn't a forgery though who cares if the student oh, students then, so, to do uh, one one john is anonymous so polycarp is not actually a disciple of john the apostle there's no evidence for that polycarp in his own works the epistle to the philippians never claims that he's a disciple of john and no one but contemporaneous even, to him or before him claimed that and he never quotes the gospel of John, which makes him unlikely to be the disciple. Oh, that's yeah. that's sick. That, that's dope. But I'm I'm saying even if we grant it that this is indeed a disciple of the disciple, and he says that hey, John is actually the apostle. Why? Like, how does that prove that John's the apostle? If John himself said that he's the okay. apostle, how does that prove that he's the apostle? Like, yeah, how? That's who, who cares how. If the that's how because that's how we do historical criticism by applying historiographical principles to see who wrote this work. Like we look if, at the if, external and internal attestation for it. Okay. Because I'm thinking if, if if the disciples' disciples said so, to me that just proves that the disciple listened to the person before him and that person listened to the person before him. Let's just say John, the apostle. But yani, there's no, uh, is, is there a narration that goes back to Isa alayhi salam that says, hey, this is the person? Like, I mean, they would claim that. They would claim apostolic succession does give you that. Yeah. But it's false. It's well, all it's I'm, 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 I'm stuck in my lane in the philosophy realm. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Habibi, I appreciate that. It's just, just 1 John 5 7 forgery. You can just say that. Forgery. Okay, forgery. No right to be in the New Testament. No right, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Professor Bruce Metzger yeah. said that himself in his textual commentary of the Greek New Testament. Wow. Uh, yeah, let's go to the next one. The done. Okay, I'll bring you up. I'm getting got people DMing me actually. One sec. Yeah, same. I've been getting way too many DMs, man. Like, I can't even. What's up, brothers? Hello. Hi, how are you? Not bad. Um, I'm actually, I was actually an uh, like agnostic atheist for like my entire life, and I actually reverted to Islam like last year. Wow, alhamdulillah. Mashallah, brother. Yes, brother, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know, um, like, if an atheist asks you to prove the existence of Allah, um, what's like the strongest like one argument you would use to prove this? Because like I've had debates where like it just goes in circles where they're like, like yeah. saying it's like too simple to just like you know leave it up to God. Like it's not it doesn't make any sense. Like, um, there's there's different ones. Like there's different arguments. There's like teleological, cosmological, ontological. Um, I can give you like there's a like a the contingency one. The contingency one is pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um, I, have you looked into it? Like, pre pretend I'm atheist right now. Like, go go convince me God exists. And maybe I can critique it. I really like the fine tuning argument, just on the basis of that, like, oh, okay, the universe is too complex. Like, we all follow orders. Like, you know, the universe follows laws, physics, math, everything. That it's just too perfect for it to be random. You know, 
Okay, basically, what, okay, so some, I was actually working on this before. Actually, by the way, guys, I thought the lecture was at like 9 p.m. EST, not this time. So what I was working is on my on my website, like I'm working on a like a page, a blog that takes you through A to Z, how to prove God logically, Allah, through the contingency yeah. argument, but it ties a couple of things together. Like it should be out literally tomorrow morning, inshallah. But it's just a contingency argument. Like, do you want me to explain it to you? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, cool. So imagine you had, okay, in order for you to exist, Okay, imagine imagine you had a situation like this, okay? I'm, I'm going to make a very, like, dumbed down, simple version. And then and on the blog, whatever, like, it'll fully explain it, okay? Imagine you had a person with a gun, okay? And in order for that person to shoot their gun, they need to ask for permission from the person behind them, yeah? And in order for that person to give permission, he needs to ask for permission from the person behind him, okay? And so on and so forth. If this went on for, for infinity, would that person ever shoot their gun? No. Right. So in the same sense, in order for some, imagine you had an existence. So step one, you have to prove the incon the logical inconsistency of having a world with things that just depend on one another. Okay. So imagine you had something that exists, but it needs another thing to exist. And that thing needs another thing to exist. And that thing needs another thing. If that were to happen for an infinite uh, cycle, if that just went on backwards for forever, then that means you'd have a, a situation where nothing can actually actualize. Nothing can actually materialize. They can, it's just a thought experiment. They can't actually be like, it's a, uh, it's the same as like the guy shooting his gun, which means there necessarily yeah. has to be something that exists that's independent. And then from that alone, you can derive a lot of character traits from Surah Ikhlas. Like for example, if, if, if it's necessary for there to be something independent, then that means by definition, everything depends on it. And then you can use my logic that I presented uh, today to show why there must be one. Um, it's sustainer. Literally, it's a sustainer because without it, there wouldn't be existence. And you get mm -hmm. to a uh, Allah. That's, that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So basically, just step one, prove why having an existence with dependent things leads to a contradiction. And then step yeah. two, that means there must there must necessarily be an independent existence. And then this independent existence must be independent, necessary, everything depends on it. And then you just describe Allah, to be honest. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the question of um, where does God from is completely illogical, correct? It would It would be illogical because it's not a question of whether he came from anything. He doesn't come from anything. He's independent right. by, by nature. And the thing is, all they can say is this. This is what they usually say. This doesn't make sense because everything comes from something. You're saying God came from nothing. This is this is illogical. Then you have to break down their type of reasoning. What they did is they did inductive reasoning. They looked at with their eyes and they saw that everything that they see comes from something. That means they're assuming that everything's like that always, which is not necessarily true. This is why it's good okay. to use the contingency argument because it's deductive. There's no induction. It's like so very straight up logic. Like this is... Like, just like, for example, because you exist, you know your great, 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 great grandmother existed at some point because she necessarily had to exist. In the same sense, because there's dependent things, there necessarily has to be an independent thing. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for the answer. Um, I have another Wait, question now. Uh, what is the response to Christians who attack Tawheed between the Sunni claim that God possesses divine attributes seems to conflict with the absolute unity of God. What is your response to that? Okay. Um, so, for example, him being Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, and whatnot? Basically, uh, Sunni claim don't... that God has divine attributes, right? And apparently, yeah. Christians would say that that contradicts unity in God. Ba I, ba okay. Basically, uh, the attributes would undermine ontological oneness. I'll describe it like that. I'll just rephrase. Okay. Like, God possessing attributes would undermine ontological oneness, pretty much. That's what they'd claim. That's the question. Okay. So if they claim that, I'd be like, why is that the case? Is it because he has attributes? Like, God can be all-powerful, have knowledge, and that can be within his essence. But the difference with the Trinity is that you don't claim that... Like, there, there's a difference between saying God is all-powerful and he's merciful and saying that there is a complete different person, a distinct person within his essence. So it, it wouldn't, it, it'd be a, it'd be a false comparison. This, the, these terminologies, these, these words, these attributes, his 99 names or whatnot, these are attributes that are necessary within, within the idea of God versus the Trinity. When you have Jesus, the Holy Spirit and the father, like these are persons, they say persons, not attributes. These are the persons within the essence. That's why it's a, it would, could contradict the law of identity. Yeah. Would, would attributes not under, would like. If attributes composed God's existence, God's essence, would that not undermine ontological oneness, though? 
it like doesn't, it doesn't compose. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't it entail composition basically no because because then we're just yeah. we're we're explaining because then we we're trying to what we're doing then is we're trying to explain the modality in which this is the, the case like we're not saying it's he's composed of mercy like if i do something nice to someone and i'm kind it doesn't mean i'm composed of kind it's uh, kindness i'm not composed of it like if i if i do something to someone and I, I show mercy for example am i and and they say wow this is a merciful person am i composed of mercy it's it's not necessary for me to be composed of mercy for me to be merciful but it is necessary for jesus to be composed of god if he's a distinct person within this very essence so that, that's why i'm saying it's like apples and oranges mm, okay uh thank you um okay moon man i'll bring you up Oh, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, one man. What's going on? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Doing good, yes. man. Doing good. Yeah, so this question uh, caught my attention. So, is Allah's uh, attributes part of Him or just a creation of His? Okay. So, for me personally, guys, I'll be honest, I'm studying the different. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm studying the different aqidah and whatnot. I kind of have a, a view on this myself, but it could be wrong, which is why I didn't want to really fully share it because I might be wrong, right? Um, so I'm not 100% confident. If you want, I can just share what I think. You guys can let me know what you think or I can just stay silent about it. It's Yeah, it's best not to talk about this, I think, because this is um like, extre like you know, aqidah question uh, about God and his yeah. relation to the, God's relation to his attributes would be like, depends yeah. what, if, uh, oh, yeah. what's your, what do you follow? Oh, your she, um, are you, yeah, are you Shia? Shia. Yeah, Zaidi. Okay, you're Shia. You're Shia. Okay, yeah, okay. we okay. can discuss um, this later. This is a bit complicated, right? Because Shia is basically, they believe in absolute divine simplicity, which is, well, Sunnis, Ahlus Sunnah claims that this is Kufr, right? But that that's like what Shias believe about God's attributes, that they're identical to the essence. That's what they say. But yeah. Wait, they, you're, saying, they're, you're saying the Shia say that the attributes are identical to his essence? Uh, yeah, they believe in I, absolute I think, divine simplicity. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think I, I don't think the narrative is that the attributes are exactly his essence. Is that the attributes describe? Like they would act. Right? They would say that all of God's divine attributes and perfections are packaged into one non-distinctive entity with his essence, basically, or like within his not within. I mean, with his essence, a one non-distinctive entity within his essence. But the the, so the, the say, idea the, the the idea of defined divine simplicity though is is not necess It's it's that these certain attributes are not necessary in of themselves. So that's why they're not composed. It's like, for example, him being merciful is that he's, it's not necessary for God to be merciful. It's just because, and that's what makes him the most merciful. It's because he didn't need to do what he did, but he did it anyways. So it's just a describing his but, act. I think that's what defined this. But I could be wrong. Like I said, I'm still learning that part. So I don't know. The, the way Shi'is and Mu'tazilites and also Christians and Jews interpret divine simplicity is that God's essence is equal to his attribute basically when they say god is love they mean like that literally like god is his attribute of love that's what they right, really right. because they say that basically would mean that that's basically how you avoid god being composed of parts of but the sunnah claims that this is kufr basically because we believe god has real attributes not conceptual att attributes so as a shi'i you i mean you might want to affirm absolute divine simplicity but um i would say it's kufr yeah pretty much Okay. Uh, I, 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 honestly, I, I wouldn't say this, so I will look forward to this. Like, I, I'm an, an ex-Sunni, yeah. I'm an ex-Sunni, so I'm still reading, you know, the books. Uh, still, you know, seeking knowledge. Uh, yeah. Honestly, guys, just for, a for, position, pretty much. For, yeah, for, uh, for, yeah. Uh, where I stand, guys, I'm not going to confirm nor deny something. I'm not going to make takfir, like, I don't know. So it's like, um, that's, that's, I don't know. The whole point of today is why there must be one God. Now, in terms of the modality in which how this God exists and the different aqidah, like, I'm not going to go into that because I don't know, honestly. I don't want to say something I don't know. But I, I wouldn't, yeah. I, I wouldn't make takfir on anyone because I don't know. Like, who am I to, you know? Yeah, I get it. But then yeah, again, I also, I, I also understand it from your position because you do know it well, which I, I get it, you know? But for me, I can't confirm nor deny that. Like, I don't know. Well, yeah, um, Allah you know, um, guys, so can we just avoid okay the questions like God's attributes and like, like you know, like Yadain and stuff like that? Like, can we just like, because um, you know, it might, it's not like something we can answer here, you know? Yeah, I, I guess. guess. I was, uh, 
just like relating to God's oneness, pretty much like how can we prove God is one and stuff like that, those kind of questions. Anyone have any other things? Okay, since no one's asking anything, actually Joe is, Joe is asking something. Oh, he just told me, he just said yakal to me, bruh. Joe, no, like, up, <laughs> Joe uh, why are you a savage, bro? What's going on? Bro, because I kept telling him, like, bro, let me ask a question, but he like... Bro, I'm getting so many questions to answer, bro. Like, come on, man. I need to let other people ask questions, too. Yeah, anyways, so my question is, like, if a Trinitarian, like, says, uh, like, he believes classical law of identity is logical, but says, no, it, but it doesn't apply the, to the Trinity, and rejects the law of Leibniz, the law of indiscernibility, okay. other than it being, like, other than him rejecting logic, is it, contra like, how is it controversial? It's controversial because it doesn't follow logic. That, that's that's literally it. Like, it's 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 an illogical. It's it's the same as me saying a triangle has seventeen sides, and that's what I want to believe. And then why do you want to believe that? Because I want to believe it. Okay, Adi, just you can't be upset when people like don't join the religion or don't believe what you're saying. Like, it's uh, like honestly, people that just say I don't want to use logic. My stance right now, and this is like, I just say, okay, cool, you have your way, and I have mine. Like me, I want to follow logic. That's it. Because I, because God gave me logic and reason. Well, why would He give me these tools not to use them? Any uh, <laughs> to go against it? Yeah. Um, what if I got a question? What if, oh, no, um, Habibi. Okay. So what if they are like a, what if they are like a pure relative identity Trinitarians, a PRI, which uh, Dr. Bo Branson spoke about them, like Peter Van Wagen, where he says, uh, no, the classical law of identity is illogical and relative identity is logical. What, like, what do do I say to these people? Okay, then then you have to go into how they can make that claim. What what got them to the conclusion that the law of identity is not, is not logical and that the relative identity is, and then you look at their premises, and then I, I don't know what the premises are on how they would prove that, right? So I, I can't say it for certain, but if I was there, I'd listen to the premises, and then I just, I'd question the premises, because if, if one premise is false, then the conclusion is false too. Okay. Uh, and last question. I, I don't know what the, the premises are, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so so you know how like uh, classical identity applies to literally everything, even non-living objects. Mm. So and relative identity doesn't apply to anything. It's like barely applies to God. Like that's it's like like limit. Is it like can I say since it doesn't apply to literally everything by that definition, it's illogical. That because the law of identity doesn't apply to everything, therefore it's no, illogical. No, no. Or... No, no, no. So you know how like law of identity applies to uh, any and everything, God, human, uh, rock, anything, right? Yeah, yeah. Can I say relative identity since it it doesn't apply to everything? Like, and that's a fact, by the way. It it only barely applies to like either pagan gods or like the Trinity. It's limited to this uh, topic. So can I say to a Christian, since relative identity doesn't apply to any and everything, therefore by that uh, definition, it's illogical. Uh, can you prove that it can't be applied to everything, though? In fact, the bread of proof is to, uh, is on them to prove that it does apply to anything, and they can't do that from what I have experienced. Okay, then if that's the case, then then you're chilling. But I I, I would you. I would uh, I would still like honestly I I don't know like I I would look into uh, cases to prove why it doesn't apply to anything because it's still good to know. You shouldn't just you know you should always look deeper. I, in terms of like premises yeah. to prove that, I I don't have it honestly. Sorry, often. Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. Anyways, um, I've got another question. So, what is your response to Christians who assert that the Quran incorrectly re misrepresents the Trinity? Uh, so in Surah Al Maidah, verse 116, it says, Did did you tell them to take me and my mother as gods? I mean, that would not be a refutation of the Trinity because it doesn't mention the word for Trinity, Thalatha, anywhere in the verse. It talks about, you know, using God and God is used fluidly in the Quran, like when it says they took their desires as God, or they took their rabbis and priests as God, it doesn't mean that they literally worshipped it, it means that they gave divine prerogatives to it, correct? So sure. it's not saying that Mary is part of the Trinity, it's just saying that, you know, they, they gave divine prerogatives to Mary. And right. I mean, Christians have several different, you know, models of the Trinity, like Latin Trinitarianism, social Trinitarianism, relative identity Trinitarianism, monarchical Trinitarianism. How can they say the Quran gets it wrong of the Trinity when they don't even agree what the Trinity is? You know? Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like you, you'd have to say, like, what's the foundation? What is the Trinity first? Just like to, to say, for example, if I say if, if I point at something and I say that's not a banana, then that means I should have a definition of what a banana is. So do you see that make sense? And 
So yeah, I have a question for you, Moshi. Mo this is probably for you, Moshi. Um, sorry. Um, is the Trinity knowable through natural theology or natural revelation, like observations in nature? The Trinity? Yeah. Can I? I would say yes. I would say yes. Like in the fidget spinners, you know. So you're saying, can you logically get to the idea that th there is a Trinity just off thinking? Observable in nature. Within nature? In nature, well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I, I can obviously give examples of things that have compositions of three within nature, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't, like, just because a contingent being can have a composition of three, it doesn't mean a necessary being does. It's independent. It has no, it's, it's unconditional. It's like, well, yeah, I can give, like, H2O. I can be like, oh, there's composition. Uh, my three fingers, like, is, is, that, is that what you mean? Sure. Would be modalism. That wouldn't be the Trinity. That would be modalism. No. Then he's saying, he, the, the questioner is asking, is the Trinity basically observable in nature? Like, you know how we can come to the conclusion that God exists without, without revelation? We can just deduce it with logic. Yes. Would, the Trinity, would that be applicable to the Trinity as well, basically? Um, I, I've tried to. I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to make it make sense so far. Like it doesn't, I, I, I haven't, say, been, I, I haven't, but maybe you have a way, I'm not sure. Yeah, fidget spinner. Do you? Anyone? Yeah, fidget spinner. Sorry, I can't hear you. Is it Trinity? It's the fidget, fidget spinner, it's a Trinity. Oh, no, 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 I thought, I thought, I, I thought he's asking, can you deductively prove that the foundation oh, no, tool? No, no, yeah. That's what the question is asking, but I'm saying, yeah, you can prove it in nature. Through, through a fidget That's spinner? That's like my... Yeah, <laughs> bro. If I if, if people That's... believe that there was five gods in one, I'd give an example of my hand. Like it's like just because there's an analogy, it's not uh, it's not it's not really proving it within nature. It's just just finding an example of a way to make it make sense, but it doesn't necessarily mean it does. This guy said, "Yo, fidget spinner is such a good uh, it's such a good one though. It's better than uh, H two O for sure." Hold on, I got a massive question. Damn. <sighs> yeah, well, let's hear it. God, insofar as I can tell it, is both omnipotent and omnibenevolent, infinitely powerful and infinitely loving. If he isn't, then that's a problem for both Islam and in the world of philosophy, and as well as in its teachings, given that I have an argument which seeks to show the existence of God in all his properties. Two of those are omnipotence and omnibenevolence. Since love is an in, in, interpersonal exchange, God is less powerful until he creates other beings which he can love, which limits his goodness, which might be construed construed as a limit on his power if he is infinitely loving he's less loving until he creates other people meaning he depends on other people to be himself which is a limit on his power the trinity solves this oh my i get what this is this is the trinity is necessary argument joe would you want to come up and refute this well what's, what's the like, question what's he saying oh I, i'll summarize it it's basically said, the I, trinity is necessary yeah. because god needs to love himself because there's no like the trinity is yeah. necessary because there's a lover loved and loving something basically yeah yeah, so love, love. Joe, do you want to refute thing. this? I mean, it's nonsense. So basically, there's just the, a short summary to a refutation from Dr. William Lane Craig. He says, first of all, he the, his, the title is called What Does Love Have to Do With It? The refutation is basically, why do you limit it at three? Why not infinite? Simple. So, yeah, that's basically the Trinity is necessary argument, pretty much. It's, basically, yeah. for the people who didn't understand, if it's necessary for to have a oh. son, and then to have a spirit for just so for love, then why not have more, 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 and like uh, infinite persons because <laughs> it's necessary. Okay. Yeah. So basically, we'll have a billion persons or more. Joe's a legend, bro. Joe mainly focuses on like Christian theology. I mainly focus on textual criticism. Like that's just that I would do. Yeah, it's actually like you guys are a good team. Well, like uh, I feel like I can learn a lot from you guys. If anything, it's amazing. Inshallah, and we can learn a lot from you. Like on the oh. atheism thing, I don't understand any of that. <laughs> Philosophy, atheism, I don't know about that. No, it's okay. The doubt finesser. What was popping? Brand new whip Yo. just hopped. <laughs> I got options. I don't know. I don't. I don't know the song. I don't. I don't got. I don't got options. Slams only way. It's the only way. <laughs> Grab that Quran. <laughs> Go ahead, bro. Nothing much. Nothing much. So what's the, what are you guys talking about with the Trinity and whatnot? No, nothing. Uh, Joe. Joe gave a very nice answer. 
Poetic indeed. <laughs> okay, look, uh, it's, uh, is there any more questions, brother? Or Let me think. <laughs> okay, how, how could you prove God is one, as in, like, how could you prove God is indivisible? How can I prove that God is indivisible? Yeah, like, that he's one, not just a number, but, like, he's oneness, like, completely, uh, completely one in and of himself, you know what I mean? Like, indivisible. Like, how would you prove that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indivisible, has no parts? Because if he had parts, then, okay, for example, if I had a puzzle, the puzzle has puzzle pieces, yeah? The totality, the whole, depends on the pieces within it. So if I remove one piece from the whole, it would be an entirely different existence. So the reason why Allah is oneness and not the number like one and is indivisible is because if he was divisible, like if you can divide one into two pieces, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, that means the whole necessarily depends on there being the idea of 0.5 and 0.5. So it, it, it's important that there is no parts because if there was parts, then he would no longer be uh, dependent. Or sorry, he would no longer be independent. He would depend. So pretty much, uh, pretty much anything that's divisible is dependent. Pretty much. Yeah, because it'll always be dependent on what it's dividing into. Oh, and it, it here in this case, it would literally be defined as dependent because it's literally defined as having parts, right? That's what some. Literally. That's what a whole is, right? Something with parts. Right. Oh, that's sick. Thanks, bro. Good question. No problem, very good. Bro, asked very good question. Brother, ask a very good question. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, I think I'm getting some questions here. Um, one sec. Oh, no, that's from another survey. Okay. All right, guys. Um, if no one has any questions, uh, is it okay if I uh, head out? Uh, or... Moshi, I'm just going to go AFA, but I'm going to go for two minutes. If you oh, Are you going to head out? Oh. No, no, it's because I, I initially thought it was 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. I messed up. I read the oh. thing wrong. So I kind of had a thing, but it's okay. Like, I don't, if there's more questions, we can definitely carry on. But if there's none, then. Mm, I'll see if someone's DM'd me. Oh, yeah. Can you ask him what exactly is incoherent about the in infinite regression of contingent universes? If, if, if something. If something's if something's contingent and its essence does not necessitate its existence, which means its essence does not actualize itself, it needs another thing. It can't just actualize itself. Then in order for something to you're basically saying this, yeah. Something in order for it to ever get actualized, it needs another. But that thing, in order for it to get actualized, it needs another, it needs another, it needs another. If this goes on for forever, then you have an existence full of like impossible existences. Nothing will ever get actualized. They'll just exist within their essence. They wouldn't actually exist. Could you give maybe like the bus analogy or the 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 shooter analogy? Kind of to yeah, explain like, that. Yeah, yeah. Like if, if I have a gun and I'm shooting and I, and I'm and this a gun and the person has a gun and they want to shoot, they can't shoot. In other words, they can't exist unless they ask for permission from the person behind them. And that person can't unless they ask for permission from the person behind him. If this goes on for infinity and you had an infinite set of permissions, then you would never ever get to a point where the command is given, a permission is given for the gun to be shot. So that's uh, that's just a good analogy. See it. Sheesh. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I think another another you, way also. Like, if we're teach? talking about universes, yes, sorry, go. Oh, do you guys know each other? Uh, how do you? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Oh yeah, so let's let's say we're talking in this case because he asked the question not just about like existences. He talked about universe, right? So let's bring it more temporal. So look, today is today, right? In order for today to get here, I had to have yesterday, and so on, and so on, and so on. The day before that, the day before that, you're essentially saying there's an infinite number of multiverses. So let's start from the Big Bang. Oh, that's not the beginning. It's the Big Bang before that, and then the Big Bang before that, and the Big Bang before that. The question is, how can it be, if there was an infinite number of days before today, how'd we ever get to today? Right? Pretty much this. If there's an infinite number of multiverses, how is it even possible? Right? How did all those previous multiverses end? 
pretty much is what I'm asking, right? It would be impossible. You can't end infinity. If there's an infinite number of days before today, right, then it could never have gone to today, right? Because infinity has no end by definition. So that's one way. <laughs> pretty much the fact that there's today means it wasn't an infinite number of multiverses. Yeah, you're saying today, how can there be today with an infinite set of yesterdays? That means we would exactly. never get to today. Yeah, exactly. Get that. Yeah, I wonder how he can animate his uh, his profile picture. That looks super cool. Mine? Oh. Yeah, it looks super sick. Is, is it just like oh, a GIF? That's how I'm typing. Yeah, you just put a GIF. Instead of like, you know, when you pick on your computer, that you like images on your computer, you just pick a GIF instead of images, does it? Wow. It's pretty, easy. It's pretty neat. Yeah. That's actually sick. Bro, I feel like, uh, I, feel, I feel like I, I hear music with that and I don't even hear it. You know what I mean? I feel like yeah, in the back. The tears come hey. cold, I'm wondering why. What's going on, man? By the way, guys, uh, for everyone just like listening right now, um, if I can just say something, I think, uh, I think we should all just practice gratitude, but not in the sense, a deeper level of gratitude. Yani, when you drink water, you know, a common thing I hear is, wow, like, alhamdulillah, that there is water, you know? There's some people that have to walk hours uh, to get water. Usually, yeah. Uh, somebody asked a question. Um, I, I just want to finish the thing about gratitude, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so it's like some people, they, they, they say, oh, alhamdulillah, that there's water two seconds away from me. Some people have to walk six hours, for example. But, yani, why not exercise a deeper level of gratitude? Like, thank you, God, for giving me the ability to even have a understand what water tastes like or giving me the ability to know thirst or if if you if you uh, fall down and you hit your knee your initial reaction is to like yell and scream or maybe to cry or what not but like to be honest like alhamdulillah for even having the ability to feel pain to be honest like let's do like a deeper level of gratitude i think that uh maybe, yeah pretty much the deeper level is stuff people never get to if that makes exactly. sense people never think about right so you you really start to expand and understand how much god's actually giving you right yeah like you know you say, yeah sorry like like alhamdulillah for even being able to say that like god could have created us without being able to say it but we're able to say it like that that, exactly. that in of itself is a blessing you know pretty pretty much also a problem is oftentimes you say alhamdulillah but a big problem is we don't feel it it'll be like our, our mom slaps us if we don't say it right we just we, we just feel like we have to say it right but if we a way to actually get us to feel it is to just go and write down all the possibilities, pretty much, right? Every single little thing that God did for us. Now, what we'll realize is we can't write everything down. Recognizing this fact in and of itself is a form of gratitude, and it's almost about as deep as you can go. Just recognizing that you can't be grateful enough, right, is a form of gratitude in and of itself. Sorry, brother, you said there's a question? Yeah, it was, um, have you ever considered any other religions or atheism? Have I ever considered, yeah, yeah, I considered atheist, I considered Christianity, um, I actually, like, uh, like, left Islam, and then I kind of, I came back to it, uh, alhamdulillah, so I've definitely considered it. Oh, someone also asked, uh, what exactly is, in oh, no, sorry, that was the same question, um, yeah. uh, are you saying that contingent existences can never be actualized? If Why it was is that an case? Because you would have an infinite set. So you're, you're, he's asking, why can't there be an infinite set of contingent existences? He's saying, are you saying that? Yes. Uh, are you there saying was, that contingencies, yes, yes. contingent existences can never be actualized? There is an infinite. If there was an existence with only contingent existences, then it would. They wouldn't actualize. No. There, there, there necessarily has to be something that's not contingent to allow for the... Or is, is he asking why that's the case? Or is he just asking, like, Moshi's view on that? Well, let's go, let's, let's go for the why, just for the sake of content. So, so why can't there be only contingent things? <laughs> well, we already, uh, we already talked about that, right? Like, if you... you, you know. Yeah, that's true. To be honest, I think the word contingent just causes confusion. Conti why don't we restate it? Yeah, well, why can't, can't we just say, like, why don't we just say this? Why don't we just say that, oh, why can't there be things that can't establish, pretty much this would be the question. Why can't things that can't establish themselves 
establish themselves, right? Contingent, by definition, just means something that can't bring itself into existence, right? So the question is, why can't you have things that can't bring themselves? Pretty much this. Aha. You, you know what I'm trying to say, Moshe? Could you like try to put that in a sick way? Yeah, essentially, all it is is this, okay? Something needs another thing to exist. It cannot exist unless there's another thing. It can't exist. It can't make itself exist. It needs another thing to exist. So how can there be an existence where it's only filled up with things that need other things to exist? That means it'll always need other things to exist. Nothing will ever actually exist. That's literally what it is. That's why there yeah. necessarily has to be something that exists that's independent and necessary. Yeah, so pretty much if you have existence with only things that can't exist on its own, then how how's there existence to begin with? Because you exactly. can just keep asking the question. Let's Let's take an infinite regress. We'll ask yes. you about the infinite regress, right? How does it establish itself, right? And by the way, no matter uh, what, yeah, sorry, go sorry, ahead. sorry. Oh, go, go ahead, Hadi, go. Yeah, yeah, so no matter what, you'll end up needing an independent something that can establish itself. Yeah. And by the, I'm, I, if you guys want, I can give you a quick rundown of like that argument as that argument, like very like clear cut, very fast, and then maybe you guys can ask questions based off what I say. Okay. So number one. There's either a conditional existence or an unconditional existence, okay? A conditional existence can only exist under the condition of something else. And an unconditional existence can exist under no condition at all. It can just exist, okay? If there was an existence with just conditional things, let's grant the infinite regress for a sec. Let's just say there's an infinite set of contingent things. By the way, that in of itself is not an explanation. You can say that that's the case. Let's just say that that's the case within reality. That doesn't necessarily entail that that's not the contradiction. Sorry, that doesn't mean that that's the explanation. But even if we say, even if we were to say that that's the case, let's just grant the impossible for a sec. Let's just say right now there's an infinite uh, set of uh, things that are conditional existences. If that's the case, if that's the case, then now we have to talk about the set itself because there's a difference between the set and the pieces within the set. The set itself is a conditional existence as well. But now we have to ask ourselves, what is it? It must, if it's conditional, it must need another. It cannot need something. It must, it cannot need something that's also conditional. Because if it could, if it needed something that's conditional, it would be within its own set. Because within, within its own set, there's an infinite number of conditional things. I'll try to explain it in a simpler way. If there's a set filled with conditional things that exist, every single conditional thing exists within the set. Then the set itself being conditional must now be conditioned under something that's unconditional. Because if it was conditioned under something that's conditional, then it wouldn't be a conditional thing because it would just depend on itself, which is not, which would go against the definition of a conditional existences. So there necessarily has to be something that exists that's unconditional, even if you granted an infinite series of conditional existences. I'm sorry if that's not confusing, but you can, you can ask questions if you want. <laughs> I'll have a question. I'll have a question too. Yeah, sure. Um... If the Father upholds a satiety, but God the Son and the Holy Ghost don't uphold the same property, then can they share the same divine essence? We're assuming that essence means the group of properties. Sorry, can you, can you ask the question again? So, if the Father upholds, like, self-sufficiency, or on being un unoriginated, right, like a satiety, right. so if, if the Father has that as a property, but the the other two persons of the Trinity, the Son and the, the Son and the Spirit, don't have a deity. Then, do they share the same essence? No, they would be different. Because to, for something to be equal to something else, it must be equal to that same thing. Like, how can something be equal to something else yeah. if so, it has different yeah. properties? Just by the law of transitive identity, they can't be different in any way at all. They are, yeah, they might. If you're going to say that A is equal to A and you follow the law of identity, then A has to be equal to A. You can't say A is equal to A, but that version of A has something different than that version of A. Then they're not equal. You're just fooling yourself. And numerically identical, as Joe would say. Right. Is there any other questions, uh, guys? Yeah. My question is why are you so based? That's Why am I so based, bro? I, what is based? I, I, everyone, I feel like an old person. I don't even know what that means. Like, what Carlos, is that? you're not, ba you're not it's based like, anymore. It's over. It's like factual, <laughs> correct, stuff like that. Like good. It's like just uh, affirmation, basically. Pretty like, much, it's just good, saying you're a second man. Facts, stuff like that. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, that's based. It's like my oh, no agreement. Way. 
That's so sick. No, bro, you guys are based. What the heck? I'm not even... Uh... Bro, you, you know you guys know more than me about all this stuff? I know nothing, honestly. Like, I'm just here, just, like, I speaking. I don't know much. anything. I don't know any philosophy, any... I don't know that. It's not my thing. No, I'd be curious, bro. Freaking Joe is a savage. Everyone here is a savage. We're just here having fun, honestly. Like... Yeah, true, true. I wish we having... had, like, more kuffar in the server because we're, like, it's it's a bit, like, you know, like, not very into faith, you know? This guy straight up said you wish you had more kuffar in the server. <laughs> Yeah, it would be good. Yeah, it would be good, you know, because yeah, it'd be, like, it'd be good, interesting dialogue it's for like, sure. It's Moshi, it's kind of like preaching to the preached, you know, like no, of course, like they already get it. Yeah, so like if we had some other people who are like opposing views, we might we might be able to like you know. Yeah, yeah. should I play devil's advocate right now? <laughs> yeah, it's it's okay. Like when uh, we'll we'll definitely do this more, right? So, like yeah, it's not. Sure. Uh, no problem inshallah okay, okay yeah, well, if, if this is it then uh this is it i'm gonna i'm gonna head out unless like mm -hmm. is there anything else no i don't anyone? see i don't see any i don't see any okay. questions. inshallah we'll, we'll do this again and then when we do this again uh, we'll hopefully we'll, it'll be more it'll be more based huh <laughs> yeah inshallah no it was pretty inshallah. based it was pretty based this time as well yeah it was pretty fun no it was good thanks guys i really appreciate it um i'll see you i'll see you much thanks for the yeah, stage yeah. Thank you for the stage. Oh, of course. Thanks, you guys. Thank As you for Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you guys. Alaykum. Okay, bye. Alright, bro. We're going yeah, to no, 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 shut up, shut up, shut up. Shush, shush, shush. Now let me roast.